Hi, it's the Herd. I'm going to let you in on a secret, a big one. The key to having a great day starts with having a great night's sleep. And once I upgraded to a Casper mattress, life in the day got better because of the night. Sleeping on my old mattress was an issue. But thanks to Casper, I sleep through the night, seven, eight hours, and I'm not a great sleeper. It's an amazing experience. Invented with two high-tech foams, Casper gives you all the support you need. And it's not just me. Time Magazine said Casper mattresses, one of the best inventions of 20. 15. It ships for free in a box so small, you can't believe it holds a mattress. Make it simple to get from your front door to your bedroom. And try it for 100 nights risk-free. They'll come pick it up if you don't love it. And I love mine. They'll refund you everything. No questions asked. Start having a great day by getting a better night's sleep. Like I did. Get a Casper. Try it at home. 100 nights with free shipping and returns. Go to casper.com slash relief and use the code relief. For $50 toward the purchase of your mattress. Casper.com slash relief. Code relief. For $50 toward the purchase of your mattress. Casper.com. Terms and conditions apply. Ah, this is The Herd. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio. Fox Sports Radio and FS1. Christine Leahy is joining me for an absolutely loaded show today. Tonight, NBA Finals, Game 1. Roll up your sleeves. Get ready. Here we go. Are you ready for tonight? Uh, Yes. I, I think the Warriors will win tonight. Who do you think? Cleveland takes Game 1. So here we go. I want to start my show with this. When you say trailblazer. Who wouldn't want to be a trailblazer? Awesome. The new thing. The face of a new movement. But you know how it works for trailblazers. They're initially mocked. Oh, they are. They're Uber. Taxis hated them. Airports hated them. People mocked them. Then they copied them. This is what they did with Moneyball in baseball. Baseball people are smart. They didn't want any new ideas. They had thought of everything. They made fun of Billy Bean. It was pitching, not money ball, not sabermetrics, not... Now every team in baseball, to some degree, uses sabermetrics and money ball. That's what happens when you're a trailblazer. You're initially criticized and mocked, or worse, and then copied. So Scotty Pippen says Steph Curry... Well, I'm just going to let Scottie Pippen talk about the best shooter in the history of basketball as the final star tonight. Here's the pipster. He's not the best player on either team. Even though he's a two-time MVP or unanimous MVP, right now he's not the best player on his team. And he's not a dominant player. But in terms of what LeBron and KD can do, those guys can dominate you in all areas of the game, Mm -hmm. from rebounding to blocking shots to defending to scoring. They beat you all across the board. Mm, Okay. First of all, number one is Steph is not physically impressive. He looks like every star's little brother, so he gets dogged. Players are really embedded in machismo. Blake Griffin, respected. What does Blake Griffin do well? Does he shoot well? No. For his size, does he rebound well? No. Defend well? No. Ball handle? No. Distribute well? No. Great teammate? Arguable. Steph Curry's the best ball handler in this league. He's also the best shooter, top 10 distributor, top 10 steals, and gets along with everybody. I know it shouldn't matter, but, you know, that thing above the shoulders matters too. Russell Wilson always deals with this. Cam Newton, beloved by players. Wins and losses, check Russell Wilson. Completion percentage, check Russell Wilson. Touchdown interception ratio, check Russell Wilson. Passer rating, check. Check, Russell Wilson. Maturity, check, Russell Wilson. Super Bowl wins, check, Russell Wilson. But Cam is more popular. Players are into size and machismo and all the things that don't really matter. Players think Marcus Mariota is better than Andrew Luck. Because Andrew Luck, neck beard, ain't cool. And Steph Curry is small. Players love Cam. Big guys, strong guys. What's Blake Griffin do well besides jump? Steph Curry scores faster than anybody in the history of basketball. Let that soak in. Faster than MJ. 
faster than Wilt, faster than Bird. He scores faster than everybody that's ever played the game. But he's small. So that's the first thing. Players are just completely overwhelmed, swayed by machismo. The second thing is, let's go back to trailblazers. When you're new, you are initially mocked, hated, disliked, and then you're copied. People made fun of Chip Kelly. A play every 13 and a half seconds? That will never. Hey, guys, we got to get a play in every 15 seconds. Two years after he arrives as Oregon's head coach, huddles disappear in the Pac-12. Three years later, they disappear in college football. Belichick, Urban Meyer stop by Eugene, Oregon for meetings. And this is Steph Curry. Like Moneyball, like Chip Kelly, mocked initially, duplicated soon after. Curry is a trailblazer. He has reduced centers and power forwards, most of them, to offensive liabilities. You can say whatever you want, Scottie Pippen. LeBron, love him as much as I do, doesn't dominate you in rebounding. Michael Jordan didn't dominate you there either or in distributing. If you are the fastest scorer in league history, don't listen to players. You are absolutely dominating. And I'll say this, I'll dispute this. I'm not sure he's the best player on his team anymore. He's a better ball handler than Durant. He's a better shooter than Durant. To this point, he's been more clutch than Durant. He gets along with everybody. He is the quarterback for a team, and Durant at this point is Gronk, a really valuable receiver. Eddie House on Speak for Yourself yesterday, reacting to what Pippen said. To be a two-time MVP, you got to be dominant. I'm sorry. In some way, some form. And if you take over games, you are dominant. You don't have to be the dominant dunker. You don't have to be the dominant defender. He's a dominant scorer. I want to shift gears to this. Um, I'm sure most of you know this. I think I've talked about it maybe once before. They don't have clocks in casinos. They also pump in oxygen. But let's stick with the clocks here. They don't have them. They don't want you to know what time it is. And then they pump in cold air and oxygen to casinos to keep you alert. The premise with both no clocks and pumping oxygen into casinos, also no windows, they don't want you to know what time it is. They want to keep you in, keep you engaged as long as you can. They don't want you to look out that window and say, man, it's, it's dinner time. It's getting dusk. No clocks, no windows in casinos. It's the psychology of Vegas. And they also, I'm told, pump in cold oxygen, keep you alert. This is the premise that the NBA uses beautifully. The NBA Finals will start on June 1st and end on June 18th. I was reading last night on social media, reading some newspaper articles. I cannot believe the Finals last three weeks. You are dumb. Stop writing. This is the way you should run a league. Baseball regular season, 182 days. Baseball's playoffs, 30 days. 16%. Not smart. Playoffs is what we all watch. We live in a frenetic, fractured, fragmented, caffeinated society. We don't watch regular season stuff anymore outside of the NFL and big college football. We watch playoffs. We're busier. Baseball's regular season, 182 days. I'll repeat. The playoffs, 30, 16%. NBA's got it figured out. Regular season, 169 days. Playoffs, 64, 40%. Of all the leagues, the two that are smartest about the playoffs, NBA 1 and NHL 2, goes back to the casino theory. Keep you engaged. The longer, the better. This is what malls do. You ever notice this about a mall? Never put an escalator in the middle of a mall. Rarely see it. They got one on one end, one on the other. Then they put that directory somewhere that's confusing. Ever been in a a mall and kind of got lost? They do that on purpose. They want exits to be hard to find. 
They want you to come down an escalator and have to walk past all their stores and those eight cell phone kiosks to get to the next escalator. Keep you in. Casinos, keep you in. NBA, keep you locked in. The smartest league when it comes to playoffs is the NBA. Like you're going to watch the first four games. It's tied at two. I'm bailing now because there's an extra day off. Oh, stop it. This is how you run a league precisely. This is exactly how you run a casino. No clocks. How you run a mall. Make people walk from one end to the other. Make exits hard to find. Difficult. Keeping you in the mall. The NBA Finals start tonight. I'll be locked in for three weeks. Hopefully it goes three weeks and you'll be locked in too. Uh, nice to have you in. We are, uh, we are as packed as we could be. We had um, yesterday on the show, we had Adam Silver, the commissioner, on. He had uh, made news, several talking points. Uh, I thought uh, of the many things he talked about, one and done's was fascinating. But I also thought talking about super teams, by the end of the conversation, if you missed it, it was almost embarrassing criticizing the Warriors in Cleveland after you heard how systematically he laid it out. I mean, after you, if you hate super teams and you listen to him, it was kind of like, oh, my, my bad. If you missed it, I'm going to let you hear that, and I'm going to let you hear that next. Adam Silver, NBA commish, on our show yesterday. In about eight minutes, I'm going to go to San Francisco to talk. Former NBA player Jim Jackson, Jason Whitlock today joining us as well. Chris Broussard, Cedric Sabalas all here. So Adam Silver, the NBA commission, stopped by yesterday. Um, I, I, you know, I started the interview by saying I think you and I are the only people on the earth that like super teams. I like them. Yeah. Selfishly, I like them because I get a. It allows me to talk more NBA. If the Washington Wizards won, you know, I mean, after the championship, I'll never forget when the Pistons, kind of the starless Pistons, beat the Lakers and Phil Jackson. And the next day, the biggest story is, is Phil staying in Los Angeles? There are all championship teams are not equal. When I was a kid growing up, the Seattle Sonics won it with Gus Williams, Dennis Johnson, Lonnie Shelton, John Johnson, uh, Jack Sigma. It was like a super starless team. It was not transformative. It was not transcendent. The Lakers with Magic were. The Celtics with Bird were. I like superstar teams. Selfishly, it allows me to talk about a sport, the NBA I love, in the offseason more. I want star teams to be assembled. Uh, but I thought Adam Silver made two great points on super teams. He's talking here about Golden State uh, and, the, and the building of the Warriors. There's a connotation around super teams that they didn't come together endemically, that they're not, somehow that's a comment not about the quality of the team, but about the way they were formed. What you have in Golden State, I mean, first of all, by any standard, you had a super team, the most winningest team in NBA history was 73 games last year, a team that was formed in essence through the draft and a few trades and without even a top draft pick. I mean, Steph was, I think, was seventh. In, in my view, that certainly was a team um, that was super. Yeah, they won a title without Kevin Durant. They've yet to win one with him. You do get that Steph Curry was passed on twice by the Timberwolves, who also later passed on Clay Thompson. Minnesota could have had Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. Between the two, they passed on him three times. They also passed on Draymond Green. Minnesota could have had all of them. You do get that Minnesota passed virtually on the Warriors stars that won a title. All of them, four times total. You do get that Milwaukee, and they gave the pick to Sacramento, took Jimmer for debt over Clay Thompson. When I had told you, lectured, argued, yelled, screamed for a month before that draft, he was the only guaranteed bust in the draft. I told you that over and over and over and over. I'm a radio guy. General managers chose Jimmer for debt over Clay Thompson. I just talk into a microphone. I don't go overseas. I don't break down video. I guarantee you, remember, I said it. He will be an absolute Jimmer for debt, will be a bust. He could not guard my couch on this set. That's the first thing. So th this idea that everybody in the league could have had Draymond Green. 
Half the teams in the league could have had Steph, Clay. Those guys won a title without Durant. Here's Silver's second point. There is an ebb and flow to these great teams, and, and I'm certainly not ready to declare that these guys are dynasties, especially when they've only each won once. Cleveland won for the first time in the history of their franchise, and Golden State won for the first time in 40 years, and now everybody's saying <laughs> they're dynasties. Cleveland's not a dynasty. LeBron James is a dynasty. If he went to Milwaukee, they'd become a dynasty. Is it the league's fault that LeBron is so much better than the second-best player? Everywhere he goes, they dominate? Remember, the Lakers in the 80s had three sweeps. In the Western Conference Finals alone, in 12 years, the Lakers made nine finals. But Kyle and Kevin Durant went to a super team. It didn't used to be that way. Yeah, my bad. Like when Barkley and Pippen joined Akeem and Drexler? <laughs> Only reason you don't remember it, they didn't win a title. The decade of the 80s, only five teams made the finals in a decade, and you loved it. Dennis Rodman already had two rings by the time he joined Pippen and Jordan. Enjoy greatness. It's fleeting. Enjoy it. Here's Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. There's so many reasons to look forward to the game tonight, and you can look for storylines everywhere. But one of the interesting ones is that Kyrie Irving actually played under Mike Brown um, for a year the first time that Mike Brown was in Cleveland. So mm-hmm. he was asked about his relationship back then. You know, it's just a learning experience. I was a 21-year-old kid, uh, you know, just trying to lead a, a franchise, and he was a, a new head coach that I had to get introduced to. It wasn't um, something that I look back on and I – kind of regret um, you know being part of that because he was just trying to teach me a lot of things that I didn't necessarily understand as a 21 year old in the NBA so um, you know he definitely has some great things and the knowledge of the game that's uh, you know up there with some great coaches. So he's talking about the fact that Mike Brown was trying to get him to make a lot of changes to his game and there were even reports that he tried to get him um, traded yeah. while he was there. Um, And then you look at Mike Brown's side of this, and he was fired by Cleveland twice, and now he's got the opportunity to head coach against them in the finals. So Mike Brown was also asked how he's looking at this game. A lot of people have said this to me, and maybe I'm made up differently, but I'm not looking at this as, you know, Cleveland fired me twice. This is a time to get back at them, or is there any extra incentive no, I just I just want to win. I don't I don't care who it is. I just want to be a part of a, a winning program and be the last team, quote unquote, standing. And uh, so, no matter who it was in front of us, and it just happens to be Cleveland. Yes, I want to win just as bad as if it was anybody else. Okay, that's the right thing to say. But you're yeah. absolutely trying to get revenge against Cleveland. He was fired twice by that team. Yeah, I don't I don't see him though as a real vindictive guy. No. I, I don't I don't you know, Kyrie's funny. When Kyrie came into this league, first of all, he's never been a good defensive player and he was injury prone. So there was a lot of doubters on Kyrie Irving. Even mm-hmm. today, there's a lot of people that like when you list the best players in the series, yesterday Bleacher Report had him at five. When you talk to players, they're like, Oh my God. Like if, when you hear LeBron talk about Kyrie, there mm-hmm. are times LeBron's like in awe of his offensive skills. I think both Mike and Kyrie have grown a lot. I think if a player can improve, why can't a coach? Mike Brown could be better today than he was six years ago. For sure. but And Mike Brown is a very nice, happy guy. But there's got to be. I mean, imagine if you were fired by a place, then they asked you to come back, and then they fired you again. No matter how happy and nice you are, you're still going to be mad. I don't know. Like, I... I actually root for my ex-wife to succeed. I want her to be happy. But that, Okay, but you didn't marry her again and then leave her. Well, no, I just... But I could have said... Oh, that actually would be her leaving you. Yeah, she, she, she was tired of me. I have no animosity. I want her to be happy because if she's happy, my kids are happy. I don't think everybody has a... I'm not a, I'm not no, a grudge. No, I get it. I just... I, I think that... I mean, I don't know because I haven't been divorced, but I think that divorce might be a little different than... It may be. I, I, I just don't see Mike Brown as a grudge guy. I think he's a very joyful guy. Okay. I would love to put Mike Brown on my staff. As I always said about Wade, I think he's the Wade Phillips of the NBA. Uh-huh. Maybe he doesn't have the ego... To be the guy, but every coach in the league, the Rams, the minute they needed a defensive coordinator and they're desperate in the front office, they went and got 70 year old Wade Phillips. Like, everybody loves Wade as a two. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Well, that's a good point, actually, that you made, that maybe he doesn't have the ego to be the guy. That's and right. if that's the case, it might make sense that he doesn't have the ego to care whether he gets revenge on Cleveland. I mean, a lot of grudge holding, isn't it ego? Absolutely. It's 100% ego. I, I, Mike is a fairly egoless guy. Like, when he came to the Lakers, I think he was overwhelmed by how much la- how much ego you needed to survive mm-hmm. the Laker organization. It's oh, for all, sure. It's all ego. Yeah. Well, I'm just looking for more ways to love this series. <laughs> Here's another one. More drama ahead in the series. Um, Draymond Green was asked how he plans to get Kevin Love off his game, and here's what he said. What is it that works against Kevin Love? What can you do to kind of bug him, get inside his head, to kind of neutralize some of the things he does so well and so effortlessly? I mean, I just try to use my speed uh, to my advantage, you know, try to take him out of spots where he's comfortable. Is he susceptible to a lot of trash talk? Can that take him away a little bit? Everybody's susceptible to that. <laughs> Here who you are. I oh. hope that he stays true to his word because yes. I love some good trash talking. Like, don't go too, don't go too personal or too bad. But trash talking makes the series so much more entertaining. And when they start getting kind of in each other's faces, I love it. Oh. Uh, speaking of getting in each other's faces, so yesterday we we both were very impressed with Austin Rivers. Yeah. Um, and I was I was surprised because then I heard that this video came out from Glenn Big Baby Davis. I'm on so his glad Instagram. you're running. I'm so oh, glad great. you're running this. Uh, I'm going to. So I, I was like, wow, I, I didn't think that anything he said was that bad. I mean, I could understand why it might have hurt him. But then I heard what Austin said on Undisputed, which was a little different than what he said here. Yeah. If someone is constantly out of shape, late, don't remember plays, how the hell are you supposed to play? So, so, so I, I don't know where that, that even goes with the team. And that had nothing to do with him coming at my father. I, I really don't care. That's between him and my pops. I've earned every stripe that I've got. Yeah, so Austin was a little more aggressive, I think, on Undisputed than he was here. I think he yes. had toned it down by the time he got here. I, I don't like that he took um, a personal shot at his weight. Um, I think he did make a lot of other points that you can see. It's just a sad kind of breakup between run the-, the two. But hold on. Here's Big Baby's reaction now to what Austin said okay. on Undisputed. All right. I'm in Hawaii minding my own business. And I look on Undisputed and I see old punk Austin Rivers talking Come on, man. Yeah, I might have been overweight a little bit. Probably late for one or two practices. Come on, man. Don't know the plays. Come on, bro. You're lying now, bro. Your father gave you your money. How can you, like, don't say to me. Your father gave you your money. You ain't work for it. Keep your mouth closed, man. Shut up, man. You're a bum who's been given the world. Shut up. Dang. You know, I don't, I... Can you run that again <laughs> next hour and the next yeah. hour? It just, it makes me, it makes me sad because I can understand where they're both coming from. I don't think Austin should have taken uh, shots about his weight and not knowing plays. Like, there's really no reason to put that out there. But I understand, too, that Austin feels offended and defensive of his father because Big Baby has definitely said his feelings sports about needs, the situation. Sports needs more of that, not less. Yeah. It, I would like it better if Big Baby was still playing. Um, then this would be more, or if Austin was a starter, um, was, it just, it makes me sad because they used to be kind of a family with the Celtics and to see that it's come to this makes me, and that there's kind of a division now between make, that group. Makes me very happy actually. <laughs> Why? I think you're, you're rooting for the, I'm controversy. rooting for chaos. That is <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and I like them both. I thought Austin was great and big babies. They, welcome. They, yes. I like them both too. So that's why it's, it's hard. I feel like we're kind of in the middle of this, um, but I'm just rooting for chaos in the series that starts tonight. That will be an entertaining one. Kristen with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Lie News. He's in Oakland for Game 1 tonight, Warriors-Cavs. He's our NBA analyst, a 14-year vet. Jim Jackson is joining us live, listening to all that stuff. Holy moly, Jim Jackson. Oh, man. <laughs> God. Oh, my goodness. I know. Oh, that was crazy. Oh, oh, oh. You know, who, who, we, you, who you got in three rounds? Who you got in three rounds? <laughs> Big baby. Yeah, or, or, that weighs him by about 
about a buck fifty, so I'll take Big Baby. So you know, everybody's okay. talking. Everybody's talking about Mike Brown and Steve Kerr. I want you to give me a yeah. player's perspective, Jim, on Ty Lue. Because when he first came into this league, I was like, "Who's Ty Lue? He played. Mm-hmm. He's going to be no good." Yeah, I, I, I've watched him now. I got to be honest with you. I didn't like the Blatt firing, okay. but he looks like he knows what he's doing. Yeah, well, he kind of does. Think about this. So Ty Lue and I were together in Houston under Van Gundy. Mike Longenberger was there. So was, you know, the rest of the crew in regards to defensive-minded coaching. And Ty was always like a coach on the floor. On the bench, he was always talking. He was in game planning. So he's been preparing and prepping for this moment for a long time. And, And that's the beauty of it now. What happens, Colin, is because of LeBron's greatness, we get into the fact that LeBron coaches the team. And maybe with Black, that's the case because maybe they didn't have the respect. But the work that Ty Lu puts in, game planning, I mean, he spends hours in regards to plays after timeouts, defensively um, scheming plans in order to negate the opposing team's best player, to make them less effective. One time in particular... Um, LeBron didn't want to come out the game. Yes, yes. And Ty said, no, you're going to sit down, and then I'll put you back in. Yep. That showed me right there who really had control of this team. And when LeBron is listening like that, the rest of the team follows. One of the reasons I think Cleveland has a real shot here is LeBron's never mm-hmm. been this rested going in. And the way the series yep. is built, Jim, six of the seven games, LeBron gets two days rest, meaning he can play 47 minutes. And I think Golden State, a shooting, a young shooting team, would rather play yeah. every other day. You tell me as a player, is there almost too much rest in this finals? Well, it, it is, and it seems a lot longer for Cleveland, too, because you, you think about the sweeps they had. Now you sit out eight or nine days. Like Golden State, too, guys would rather sit out maybe four or five instead of nine days. Yeah, that's a lot. Because at least you don't lose all of your rhythm. Um, You want to get the series over with as quickly as you can. You want to get some rest, but how much rest is too much rest? I mean, it it stretches it out for the fan to watch through June. But guys just want to get out and play. And, And again, the way this series is built, LeBron is really good on two days rest. He gets focused. His body is in shape. But also, from a game-planning perspective, he's so dialed into what he has to do on the court that it gives him a slight edge over other players. You know, uh, um, we know this happens in all sports. In hockey, they shrink the goalie's pads. They did it again this year. Yeah. And that helps star players. That increases scoring. So we know baseball has lowered the mound to help uh, batters. Mm-hmm. I really believe this to be true. That you don't have to release a memo if the Warriors, who swept, swept, swept the first three series, and then they get up 2 nothing mm-hmm. on Cleveland and their blowouts, I think it will be an unspoken moment for the refs to say, we have to allow more physicality or this is going to be ugly. You don't have to tell the refs that. Have you ever been yeah. in a series, Jim, where you felt the officiating changed in the series? You know what? Well, back in when I played, it's fortunately for me, when I got my first touch of the playoffs, it was the 98-99 season, the lockout season, when I was with Portland. Yeah. And it was physical play at that particular point. But our first round season against Phoenix wasn't as physical as when we finally got to San Antonio. And you can feel the shift, the momentum change. Now, I'm going to tell you what, last year's final – when Cleveland played Golden State, you remember how physical that was compared yes. to yes. the other series in front? Because the officials understand kind of what's on the line. They're going to allow the guys to play and get away with the holding, especially keep your eye on the physicality away from the ball. That's where I think Cleveland, and I talked to you about this before, has the advantage when they're guarding Steph. They're really physical with Steph away from the basketball. So by the time he gets it, he's a little worn out, a little tired, but officials do look at it in regards to allowing guys to play a little bit more physical than what they did, not just in the regular season, Connor, but in the series, 
the conference finals right before. You know, yesterday Scotty Pippen said uh, Steph Curry's a great player, but he's not dominant. I would argue he's the fastest scorer right. in NBA history. That's dominant to me. My my takeaway is a little bit is a he's not a physically dominant player, and players like other big players. That's why you know I mean that's just right. the way the NBA is. We don't like Steph looks like everybody's little brother, and I think that that plays <laughs> right. a little bit of a part to it. The second thing is I wonder if there's not a little animosity because Steph Curry in the three ball gym have reduced centers and power forwards sometimes to liabilities. Do you sense when all these old guys don't like Steph, there's a little bit of that going on? Well, there's a lot of it going on. It's not only the three-pointers, Colin, but it's the little floaters, the runners, all these little finesse shots. Yeah. It was great when we first saw it, when he was in college. Oh, look at this. It's spectacular. This little guy is, uh, you know, creating havoc when he – Finally got healthy at Golden State. He revolutionized. But then, as you know, Colin, as you gain more success, people are going to try to tear you down a lot more. I love the way he plays. I love what he brings to the table. I love his personality. I love the way that now young kids look at it and say, I may be only a buck 20, but now I can compete at a high level. Yeah. I never get into the fact that because I'm an older player, well, back in the day we did this and he wouldn't. No. This era is built a lot differently. And Steph Curry – is ushering that ushering in that new era and he's been highly successful doing it so why not embrace it instead of always trying to tear somebody down because oh well he didn't do it the way i did it well guess what you didn't do it the way the generation before did it either and finally adam silver was on the show yesterday uh, i suggested to him to get rid of the one and done if guys want to go to college let them go if they don't don't yeah. i think you have to give players trust their instincts let them get the information and he adam silver seemed to suggest that they're going to rethink it very quickly go back to your yeah. last year in college are you for the one and done or would you have preferred high school to the pros how do you fall in it well, I'm for the one and done from this perspective, Connor. And I listened to that interview, and it was great yesterday. Is that you should have, a guy, young man, should have an option whether college is for him. I don't care what it is, whether it's school, baseball, basketball, football is a little bit differently. But here's my thing, and I think Adam Silver hit on this as well, that we really have to modify and enhance. And you said this too, the MBDL. This is an opportunity for a young man who may be not physically and mentally ready to go into the NBA, but for a year or two, understand what it is like to be a professional, learn the game, learn the lifestyle, and then now when he's put in the situation to be on an NBA roster, he's ready to go. So that's where I think the dynamic can come in, where if a guy just said, listen, college is not for me, an opportunity for me to move on and take care of my family, but put him in a situation where his failure rate is diminished by improving the D-League. By the way, how big was that train that just went by? Is that the world's loudest train? <laughs> that's, that's, that's the second train. But you notice my concentration level was right here on you, Tyler. I, know, I never got away from it. I listened to everything. What train? I don't know what you're talking about. Jimmy Jackson, good talking to you, bud. <laughs> Thank you, too. Uh, Another reason I think tonight's championship start is going to end in seven games. I think it's going to be a really, really even series, and I think there's a precedent for it, and I'll get to that next. Takes more than a roof to make sure your home is covered. Farmers Insurance, 89 years of knowledge and experience. Protect what's important to you. Learn more at Farmers.com. Uh, I think the refs will play a major um, part in this series, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, First of all, I think we're going to have a close series because if you look at the last seven major championships, the last championship was the Final Four, Gonzaga, Carolina, close. Super Bowl, overtime. College football, Clemson over Bama, last play. World Series, seven games. NBA Finals, seven games. March Madness, game-winning shot, Nova, Carolina. Masters went to a playoff. In my lifetime, I don't ever remember a time when this many championships in succession came down to the last three and four minutes. Um, I think also Cleveland's legit. I think they're healthier than Golden State. I think they have more veterans than Golden State. I think they have the confidence of a champion that beat Golden State. I think Love, Kyrie Irving, and LeBron are playing their best team basketball ever. I think Cleveland has a more physical roster. I think Cleveland faces less pressure. And I will say this, and I believe this to be true, 
the referees, having watched Golden State destroy three straight teams, if they get up big in this series, will allow for more physical play. That is not fixing the NBA. That is not rigged. We see sports do this all the time. Augusta tiger-proofed the Masters. Was that fixing the Masters? NASCAR does this all the time. They punish dominant teams. They would prefer everybody is tied to a string. So Augusta tiger-proofed the Masters. Wanted it closer. NASCAR, on a weekly basis, changes rules, modifies to keep cars closer. We've seen baseball 26 times raise lower amount to help hitters. The NHL, again this year, shrinks the pads of a goalie. What does that do? More scoring. Who does it help? Star players. Years ago in hockey, they got rid of clutching and grabbing. Who did it help? Offensive players. Who did it hurt? Physical defensive teams. The NBA would simply do the opposite. They would intuitively, there is no memo needed. If Golden State just starts running away with this thing, we know one team has a more physical roster. From Love to Tristan to LeBron to Darren Williams, they'll modify their officiating. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we've seen it in NASCAR. We've seen it in the Masters. We've seen it in hockey. We've seen it historically in baseball. Leagues all the time, a salary cap. A salary cap's not there to help New York and L.A. It's to help the little guy. NASCAR helps the little guy. Golf helped everybody but Tiger. And I, and I don't think, you know, conspiracy guy always thinks there's a memo. You don't need a memo. It's understood. If you miss, if you forget your wife's anniversary, there doesn't need to be a memo that you better go big on her birthday. No memo needed. It's the unspoken truth of marriage. Missed on one thing, make it up on another. Just like when a teenager blows through a curfew. When you come down the stairs in the morning, mom's not happy. You ask her if you can clean the living room. There is no memo. It's unspoken. This happens every day in our life. Little late to a meeting, suck up to your boss. Little late on the anniversary, suck up to your wife. NBA officials, and they've done studies on this, it's worse in college than professional basketball. Look it up, wrote about it in my first book. They've done studies on this. Basketball officials like to help and assist the team that needs it. You're trying to create a fair atmosphere. And with Golden State rolling over three straight teams, if they start rolling, watch for physical play to be allowed. And never forget this. Because we're going into what is going to be considered to be an all-time series, refs don't want to decide this. Just know that going in. Just know that in the last minute or two of every game in this series, they're going to allow physical play. Advantage LeBron, disadvantage Durant, and Steph. Know that. Like, just just know that going in. When you have an all-time series, and everybody knows it's going to be an all-time series, refs don't want to get in the way of it. They don't want to get in the way of this thing. Last minute of games... Don't kid yourself. A lot of whistles going to be swallowed. I'm okay with that. But don't yell and scream it's rigged and it's pro LeBron. Just know that going in. Just know that going in. That's what you're going to get. So I think we're going to have an all-time series. Upside.com. Want you to check it out. I've used it. Real deal for saving money and getting a big gift card every business trip you buy. Got to use the code HERD at Upside.com. Code HERD. A $100 guaranteed Amazon gift card. They combine Flights and hotel rooms, minimum purchase required. Upside.com, see site for complete details. Uh, Unfortunate, discouraging situation happened with LeBron James yesterday at his second, third, or fourth house here in California. Uh, Vulgarities, racial slurs, 
uh, spray painted on a part of his house. He was not there. His family was not there. Jason Whitlock will talk about that on the other side. Also, Chris Broussard and Cedric Sabalas join us. I have not made my official prediction yet on the series. I will do that coming up next hour. I will make my official lay it on the line. John, do we have recording devices for this? We could probably get one in time, yeah. Okay. So, Christine, have you made your official? I'm gonna write I a- made it yesterday. Okay. Warriors in seven. In seven, yeah. All right, let me write this down. Christine Leahy, Golden State, seven, CC. Okay. You realize that this is being recorded right now. Is it? We have yeah, recording? Yeah, you don't need to write it down, but you, you can. So this is being recorded? It sure is. Okay. You know, there's a lot of new technology out there. I just figured out Snapchat. So I just want to make Did sure. Did you get a Snapchat? Yeah. Well, no, I figured it out yesterday. What do you mean you figured it out? <laughs> you have Snapchat? Didn't say I had it. I so was, I whose was, were you using? Well, I don't want to get into things, but I have discovered, uh, I understand it now. Listen, I'm not a guy that waits in line at a store to get the newest technology. I do eventually embrace it. It just, ta- it just takes me a couple of years to <laughs> um, embrace it. All right. Uh, Jason Whitlock's around the corner. Hour one, hour two coming up. It's The Herd. This is The Herd. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening, live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, and FS1. Christine Leahy is joining me. Game one of the NBA Finals tonight. I will have uh, my prediction. Christine Leahy likes uh, the Warriors in seven. My friend Jason Whitlock joining us in about two minutes likes the Warriors in five. I will have this hour my prediction on the NBA Finals. I have thought long and hard about this. I want to start this hour with this before I get to Jason. Scottie Pippen was talking about the Warriors and Steph Curry, and he's not a dominant player. This is from my former network. Let's roll the tape. He's not the best player on either team. Even though he's a two-time MVP or unanimous MVP, right now he's not the best player on his team. And he's not a dominant player. But in terms of what LeBron and KD can do, those guys can dominate you in all areas of the game, mm-hmm. from rebounding to blocking shots to defending to scoring. They beat you all across the board. I don't think you have to dominate people in all areas of the game to be dominant. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar did not dominate you in distribution. Michael Jordan didn't dominate you on the glass. Here's what I know about Steph Curry. He scores faster and with more efficiency from the range in which he shoots than any other player in the league. And what I like about Steph Curry and I like about LeBron James, they are the modern player. And both, the only two stars in this league that seem to irk former stars are LeBron James and Steph Curry. And I think some of it is they are the millennial attitude of the new NBA. They're okay playing with other stars. That is not to them a weakness. It is a strength. People used to say about President Obama, he's detached. Is he detached or is he mature, not having to run to social media every time he has a thought or is perturbed? Is Russell Wilson detached or is the Seahawk quarterback mature, not wanting to get involved in teammate-friendly fire? Sometimes what we view as a weakness can actually be a strength. I love the idea that LeBron and Steph Curry – can fully and eagerly embrace other stars. LeBron can let Kyrie dominate a half. Kobe struggled with that. Steph Curry can embrace Kevin Durant. Michael struggled with that. By the way, they all love Westbrook. Westbrook's old school. Westbrook won one playoff game. I'll take Steph and their mindset. I'll take LeBron and his mindset. I want to bring on now uh, Jason Whitlock, my friend, the host of Speak for Yourself. Very rarely, Whitlock's a very busy man. Very rarely does he text me, Christine, and uh-huh. say, "Do you like? Would you like me on the show?" And of course, I would like you on the show. I have encouraged your participation with this show. Much like <laughs> Steph, I welcome other stars eagerly. <laughs> that means you have something to say, Jason. I do have something to say. So let's start with uh, your re- initial reaction when you saw the racial slurs had been written on LeBron's L.A. home, not far from here. You know, I I think it's a disrespectful inconvenience for LeBron James. Uh, I I think that 
This is where I struggle with LeBron James. He has fallen into the far left trap of there's value in embracing your victimhood. And so LeBron, I, I watched his press conference. I saw it yesterday, saw it again today. And uh, he his comments analogizing any part of this to Emmett Till is preposterous. Now, it, 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 uh, inform our audience of that. <laughs> Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy from Chicago who went to visit his uncle in the 1950s in Money, Mississippi. Money, Mississippi is probably the w- dumbest name ever to call that city money. It should have been called No Money, Mississippi. Very poor, depressed area, about a three, 400 people, uh, uh, one industry town, poor people lived there. Emmett Till uh, had an interaction with a white woman and was brutally murdered by her husband and her husband's half-brother. Brutally murdered. 14-year-old boy, allegedly because he may have whistled at the woman, but we come to find out later he did not. Brutally murdered. It's one of the most tragic historic events in African-American history. There's no analogy between that and what happened to LeBron James. He allegedly had the N-word spray-painted on his $20 million Brentwood home. He wasn't there. His family wasn't there. He heard about it. He's on stage on my family safe. From what? Spray paint? They're in Cleveland. Uh, Again, I, I don't want... Racism is an issue in America, but it is primarily an issue for the poor. It's not LeBron James's issue. LeBron James, whether he likes it or not, or whether people close to him are telling him or not, he has removed himself from the damages and the ravages of real racism. He may have an occasional disrespectful interaction with someone, a disrespectful uh, inconvenience. But again, you talk about the people that murdered Emmett Till got off. An all-white jury let them off. There was no real investigation. The whole town was against him. LeBron's $20 million Brentwood home gets vandalized, and I see two or three police cars trying to get to the bottom of it. LeBron's staff, I'm sure, cleaned up the spray paint within hours. This ain't Emmett Till, and we need to quit. And LeBron needs to quit embracing his victimhood because he's not a victim, and it's a terrible message for black people that, oh, my God, it's so – and again. It is discouraging, though. It is – don't – don't listen. It's inconvenient. It's disrespectful. I don't – Colin, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I'm grown. I, I, I've – I get when I was a young person, some people called me a bad name, the N-word, whatever. It hurt my feelings. But d- stop me from rising? Hell no. Stop LeBron James? And, you know, LeBron's comment about uh, no matter how rich you are, no matter how famous you are, it's tough being black in America. That is a lie. It's not tough being Oprah Winfrey. It's not tough being LeBron James. It's not tough being Jason Whitlock. When I leave here today, I'm going to drive to Wilshire Boulevard, get out of my car, and throw the keys to my car to some white or Latino man who's going to say, Mr. Whitlock, anything I can do for you today? I'm going to walk into my building, the concierge, probably black, Mr. Whitlock, I got a package for you. Anything I can do for you today? And then I'm going to go up to my fourth-floor apartment and continue to do whatever the hell it is I want to do. And I'm not nearly as rich as LeBron James. And so to sit here and act like LeBron, Oprah, me, uh, <laughs> and a bunch of people in between have some miserable life or, oh, we get out of bed every day like, oh, God, I'm black. What am I going to do today? <laughs> oh, I hope I can make it. I'm black in America. Should That's he- not our existence. That's a lie. So what should he have said? What he should have said was, when asked the question, he's like, man, that's terrible. Uh, I hope that the people involved 
uh, are are caught and learn a lesson from this. Uh, I'm fine. Yes, racism is an issue in America, but this is something me and my family will get through. It's not that big of a deal. Where the real impact of racism is, is among the poor. Where the real impact of graffiti is, is among the poor. Because again, when they graffiti your name in Compton or one of these uh, poor communities in Los Angeles, it's a death threat. And there is some family safety concerns. But when your family is in Cleveland and you live in a $20 million estate, unless OJ got paroled this week, there ain't a whole lot going down in Brentwood, Colin. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of violence and murder and threat to families. And so again, this message that we're constantly pumping out to young black people and the black people that we're just victims. And oh my God, the worst thing in the world is to be black in America. It's just not true. The worst thing to be in America and anywhere on the planet is poor. Go do the numbers, go through the stats. If you're poor, regardless of color, you're catching hell in America and on this planet. LeBron has risen above poverty to that special elevated place we have in this society where pretty much nothing can bother him. And to sit here and say that, oh, my God, my house was vandalized in L.A. and on the eve of this great sporting event, I'm traumatized. It's just not true. He didn't say it was traumatized. I understand, but th- that was the the way he postured and, you know, the way – again, it was all said for the benefit of social media and Twitter. It, 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 again, I, I was, I'm fired up about it because, again, this is the Embrace Debate Network. That's what we label ourselves as. Yeah. And so I'm not out of bounds here when I say I watched Undisputed and saw Shannon Sharp today say the hardest thing is being black in America. <laughs> I was just like, this is cr-. Have Have you ever tried to be a veteran that lost a leg in America? H- have you ever been a poor person accused of a crime and forced to go with a public defender in America H- of any color? It's if you're poor, regardless of color, you are catching hell. I've been poor. Shannon's been poor. We know the difference. We we know how good our lives are, and we don't need to pretend like, oh my God, this is so terrible. What's happening to us? But- we need to be defending the poor and disadvantaged, and talking about their issues because our issues are very minimal. LeBron's issues from this bit of vandalism, there are no repercussions. There, there's the, the police are going to try to get to the bottom of it. His staff of flunkies and help will clean it up. It's nothing. It, it, and again, I'm not excusing race. Whoever the person is, whether they be black, white, or Latino, They're because creep. it's a possibility, yeah. it could be anybody. They're idiots and stupid. But is, Lebr- is LeBron in some type of jeopardy? Will he be out tonight Think, oh, my God, they vandalized my house. I don't know if I can make this jumper. No. Jason Whitlock, speak for yourself. More than good seeing you. Thank you. It's the Herd. Welcome back. Tommy and Midson. Takes more than a roof to make sure your home is covered. Farmers Insurance, 89 years of knowledge and experience. Learn more at Farmers.com. So Adam Silver was on the show yesterday. I will have my NBA Finals uh, prediction later this hour. I've been pretty good on it. I don't keep track. I read a story about a week ago that Stephen A. Smith has been wrong on seven straight NBA Finals. Uh, I've been right on most of the last eight. I think this is going to be... Uh, A very, very good series. I think Tyron Lue is underrated as the Cavaliers coach. I think Cleveland's healthier. I think they go in as a dog. I think they face less pressure. Uh, I think the officials will allow it to be a more physical series like they did last year. Uh, I do think LeBron's numbers will not be as dominant as they were in the Eastern Conference because I think JaVale McGee and Ja Ja and Draymond Green uh, are a combination of rim protector and wing annoyance. Um, and so I think Kyrie and Kevin Love will have to have a very, very good series. 
But um, I, I don't buy into this sweep, Warriors in five stuff. I think Cleveland's a great team. They've proven it. They're well-rested. The series actually works in LeBron's favor where he gets two days off for six of the seven games. I do think it will go long into a six or a seven-game series. And with Steve Kerr being out, Ja Jean, Andre Iguodala having been injured this playoff season, also Kevin Durant dealing with an injury earlier this year, I think I get a healthier team, a team with better chemistry, I don't know what I get from Clay Thompson. I know what I get from every single Cleveland Cavalier in this series. And if they win game one tonight, which I think Cleveland will win game one tonight, then suddenly they also have home court advantage. I think tonight is Cleveland's game. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll win the series. But having nine days off, even at home, never forget last year in the finals, Cleveland blew out Golden State three times, including once at Oracle, there's a precedent here. I think the chemistry right now is better for Cleveland. With Steve Kerr, maybe coaching, maybe not. I get more uh, defined coaching role from Tyron Lewin. Cleveland, the benches are a coin flip. I like Cleveland's. Depends on if Ian Clark shoots well for the Warriors. So for that reason, I am going to take the Cleveland Cavaliers to win in seven games. Uh, I thought about Cleveland in six. I didn't want to get greedy. I think it's going to be a great series. I'm going to take the Cavs. I'm going to take them in seven. Um, I like them tonight. Remember, Golden State has struggled more in game one than other games. They were tied late with Portland in game one. They struggled against Utah. They were sluggish. Their spacing was poor. And San Antonio was blowing them out before Kai, uh, Kawhi Leonard got hurt. They were blowing them out in game one. I think the size, intensity, and a moderate layoff, not a ridiculous one, gives Cleveland an edge tonight. I'll take the Cavs tonight, shifting home court advantage, adding pressure to Golden State, and I'll take the Cavs in seven games. That is my prediction for the series. Christine Leahy is going, Warriors in seven, and a majority of the media, I would say, has the Warriors in five. I do not see it that way. Had Adam Silver on the show yesterday, thought he was very interesting. One of the things he talked about was the one and done, and I suggested to him that it is a charade, let kids out of high school go wherever they want, whenever they want. Many will still go to college. Here was Adam Silver's thoughts. I'll take your point one step further. Even the players, the so-called one and done players, I don't think it's fair to characterize them as going to one year of school. What's happening now, even at the best schools, they enroll in those universities, some great universities, and they attend those universities until either they don't make the tournament and the last game, therefore, of their freshman season, or to whenever they lose or win in the NCAA tournament, that becomes their last day. So in essence, they, it's, a, it's a half and done. Just think about this. If I said to you, Christine, who's the big beneficiary of the one and done in college basketball? Most people would say Kentucky. Yeah, They're the one-and-done program. So just think about this. Kentucky's the big winner in this. Kentucky basketball won two titles in the 40s, two in the 50s, one in the 70s, two in the 90s, and just one since Calipari arrived. On those two most recent championships, in the 90s anyway, all players except Antoine Walker had played three and four years. Those were mature men who stuck around at Kentucky. So the one and done gets Calipari all this publicity. That I would not deny. No question. Kentucky gets more press than anybody in college. But it's not translating to more titles. I would argue that it adds more pressure to Kentucky basketball. There is a sense now they should win every year. They're the overwhelming favorite, by the way, next year because they got four of the top seven high schoolers. So Calipari has actually embraced a system that, A, is harder to coach, and B, is more exhausting to recruit. Think about this. When one and done became a thing, we were like, what about the little guys? Gonzaga's winning percentage before the one and done was 68%. In the era of one and done last year, 95%. North Carolina won a title this year. Top four scores, juniors and seniors. Programs like Villanova, Gonzaga, Wichita State are better today in the era of glamour and one and done at Kentucky. Yes, Kentucky's more glamorous. I do not think they're a better program today. And since the one and done era really started, you do realize that Kansas, 
Syracuse, Carolina, Ohio State, and Florida have a better winning percentage than Kentucky. And some of those are in a tougher conference than Kentucky. One and done is glamour for Kentucky. I don't think it makes their program any better. They were winning more titles without it. And they've got an elite coach now. They haven't always had an elite coach. they got an elite coach now. Here's Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. Okay, this is going to take a second to explain, but back at the Canelo Alvarez, Cesar Chavez Jr. fight, Dana White was a special guest of Oscar de la Hoya. So just keep that in mind as I tell you the rest of the story. Okay. So Oscar de la Hoya is now criticizing Dana White and the potential Floyd Mayweather Conor McGregor fight. And he went on and on saying how it would be bad for boxing, bad for UFC. Um, really went off about this. And remember, Dana White was just his guest at a recent fight. So here is Dana White's response now to what Oscar de la Hoya said. But Oscar and I have always had a good relationship. I was just at the fight. He's talking about money grabs. Canelo Chavez, you know what I mean? You're going to put on a fight like that and then call McGregor, McGregor Mayweather a money grab when, when you were trying to make that fight four months ago. Why would you say something like that? Um, you know, instead, it, it makes it sound like he has no confidence whatsoever in Triple G versus Canelo. If he's watching this right now, what do you say to him? Oscar, what the <laughs> what, what? Seriously, what the f- is going on with you are you nuts are you out of your mind have you lost your mind okay so in defense of oscar de la hoya the um chavez and canelo fight was extremely boring but they did bring out triple g at the end which made it pretty awesome yeah. um and that kind of redeemed it in a little bit of a way um I can see where both sides are coming from here, though. I, I have to be honest. I've been kind of sick of talking about the Floyd Mayweather Conor McGregor fight too, because it's always, oh, it's happening, it's happening. We have a date, and then it doesn't happen, and it's like, why are we talking about this it, thing that doesn't again, exist? I'll say this, as I said with Big Baby. Any time in Herdline News, people are swearing at other people. <laughs> it's a win for the show. We've got nothing but chaos on today's but show. But they're fighting about something that I feel right now is imaginary. Like it's not even real. I liked it. I'm a big fan of it, actually. Of people fighting for yes, no reason. I just like all the arguing today. <laughs> well, there's there's going to be even more, I promise you. Uh, Danny Ainge said that there are a handful of teams that have inquired about their number one pick. Um, he said that if they were going to get rid of that pick, they will look for at least another first rounder in return. Um, but he's not sure what they're going to exactly do, or that could mean maybe they won't get Mark Helfoltz um, after all. But I do know that Danny Ainge will make a smart move and a good deal because he is a ruthless GM. Well, his last 22 draft picks, no all-stars. That's a you lot. You look at it so... But look, who else has gotten an all-star? I don't know. The Warriors got Steph Curry. The Warriors that was, got... That, that was good. Clay it's, a very, it's much harder Golden than State you put it. Golden State is out-drafted Boston. They also were just the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. Yes, they lost to Cleveland, but... They're not doing so bad. I keep telling you, I would draft Lonzo Ball. I would. I'd screw number one. It. Absolutely, I'd screw the. If Lonzo, if if the Celtics took number one, what would Magic do? Cry. If you, you can make so? a general man, I think they're. Well, now the Lakers are saying they're not so sure, uh, and that Lonzo would have to prove himself sure in the workouts. They, yeah, they say a lot of things there. Let me tell you something. They're talking about. I'll ask Chris Broussard about this. I think the Lakers want Lonzo badly. Okay. And finally, as if I could not love him anymore, Russell Westbrook is enjoying his offseason. Him and his wife just went to a John Legend concert where for one day he could be an ordinary person and just enjoy the lovely sounds of John Legend, who is amazing. Do you like John Legend? Yeah, I, I once went to a restaurant and saw him. That's the only fame, famous person I've ever seen at a restaurant. That's a lie, first of all. And what restaurant were you at? It was one around the corner from here that had Italian food and was very good. Dantana's? No, may have been, yeah. I went with a friend and I saw, I walked in, I'm like, hey, there's John Legend. Was he with Chrissy Teigen? He was just with a bunch of guys oh. eating pasta. Seemed well, very, very happy. Right. Well, all of me loves all of Russell Westbrook, always. That's Chris, the news. Chris team with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Live Let's news. bring on Chris Broussard. Let's get to this Lonzo Ball stuff. Look at you in the jumpsuit. I like it. I think you look like a playa. I, I mean, like I it. saw Whitlock on here in the T-shirt. I said, you know what? 
I love it. I can go casual. Let's make this a new rule. I like it. As long as it doesn't conflict with the other shows, I can do this. All right. No, and it's cool. It's all Nike, coordinated. No, I think it looks great. Let me see your shoes. Well, you look comfortable. Good. The Jordan 11s. I like it. So th- this Lonzo Ball thing, we, we, we've you. had this discussion on the air and off. If I was Boston, I'd just screw with the Lakers. First of all, I like him anyway. It's not like I don't like him. If I liked him, I'm like, I, if I'm the Red Sox, I can actually get in the Yankees' head. If I'm Alabama football, I can get in Auburn's head, Kentucky and Kansas' head. What do you think? Who, who do they take number one? I think they take faults if they keep the pick, but... I agree with you. If I'm Boston, I'm I'm messing with the Lakers because I do feel like the Lakers definitely want Lonzo Ball, no matter what they're saying. Of course, they're smart to say other things. And if they get any of these other guys, as, as greatly talented as they are, Josh Jackson, Jason Tatum, Markel Fultz, to me, it's just another young hot shot that needs to get his. Right, Just like D'Angelo and Brandon Ingram and Jordan Clarkson and the rest of the guys they have, Julius Randle, you bring in Lonzo Ball, he's bringing everything together. That's what he does is make other people better and create unity on the team, on the court. And that's what the Lakers need. They have a lot of young talent. They don't really need another young, talented guy that wants to shoot the ball all the time. So I would go with Lonzo Ball. And if I'm Boston, I'm putting it out there that I want Ball. And if you want him, Lakers – you're going to have to give something up. Yep. That's it. Right? Exactly. There's a lot of games. You know, Mel Kuyper used to always say this. He's like, listen, I know I get manipulated around the draft. And so there's a lot of stuff said before. NFL draft, NBA draft. And let me tell you, that this Lakers now, you know, we're not really that interested. You and I know it. We live in this city. Alonzo Ball is who the Lakers want. No question. And I don't think I think they're right on that. Now, Scotty Pippen, do we have the Scotty Pippen bite? Scotty Pippen is saying yesterday, it's kind of interesting that Steph Curry, well, here's Scotty Pippen from yesterday. He's not the best player on either team. Is Even it? though he's a two time MVP or unanimous MVP, right now, he's not the best player on his team. Right. And he's not a dominant player. But in terms of what LeBron and KD can do, those guys can dominate you in all areas of the game, mm-hmm. from rebounding to blocking shots to defending to scoring. They beat you all across the board. Why, why can't any of these stars embrace Steph? <laughs> what is it, man? <laughs> Fastest score in league history. Nobody <laughs> likes him. Well, let me – first of all, Scotty was admitting on national TV that he wasn't a dominant player because he was never the best player on his team when he was winning championships with Michael Jordan. Okay, was Shaq or Kobe not dominant – with I guess Kobe because Shaq was the best player on the team. Kobe was still dominant. So who wasn't dominant? Magic or Kareem? <laughs> you know, like you have to be the best player on your team to be dominant. That's ridiculous. Go look at the Celtics with Russell and Havlicek and Casey Jones and exactly. Were- I mean, come on, man. It's like I, I look with current players. I think the reason some of them have issues with Steph, and I've talked to some about this, is because Steph. You have to guard him, and he'll light you up. But then he doesn't guard you, opposing point guards. So it's kind of like a sucker punch. Like, I got you, and then you run away, and you don't give me a chance to to get back at you. Because Clay Thompson generally picks up. And it's smart by the Warriors. Because Clay's a great defender. It's smart strategy. It's not Steph's fault. But that is why some guys do kind of look at him differently and say, well, you know, it's basketball. It's not just shooting. It's both ends of the court. The thing is, very few of the point guards are great defenders. You know, but at least they they feel like at least they try. Who here here are the two players in American sports that are great but get a lot of pushback? Russell Wilson, Seahawk quarterback, and Steph. Both are mature. Both are um, um, good emotional, even temperament. Good Uh, families, strong families. Like it's interesting, right? Like people love Cam. But they don't like Russell. <laughs> Russell's a better player. People are all over Steph Curry. He comes out with a shoe. Let's be honest. Is it Russell Wilson and Steph, to some degree, kind of burb kids? And it, does it create some resentment in the league? I, I hope not, but it seems like that. that you, you just hit it on the head. It seems like that is an issue. How can Russell be 50-50 love in his locker room? They were a losing <laughs> franchise before him. Unbelievable. You know, they're clean cut. Uh, as you said, they they're from the suburbs. They came from you know money. Um, they're 
you know, family guys. Yeah, kind of religious. Both of them, both of them are actually religious. Um, and I hope that's not the case because they that, – and, and let's face it. We're talking about the African-American community because it's, it's a lot of African-American players that have trouble with, with Russell. And obviously in the African-American – you know, African-Americans dominate basketball. So uh, a lot of the players you talk to are having issues with Steph. But I would say – that when we all talk about uplifting the black community, that's what we want. We want more Steph Curry's and Russell Wilson. Well, I used to we want guys coming from great families and getting educations and having legitimate marriages and raising their children up. You know, that's what we want. Well, so I used to people def- got to start thinking about that when they criticize. I used guys. to always say that when people would say oh, Obama was detached, and I used to say. Why? Because he doesn't run to his Twitter account? Like, is that, Thank you. That's a weakness? I, I like my president to have some ability to go, all right, that hurt. I'm going to take a deep breath. Not sprint to his Facebook account. Yeah, no, nah, no question. Okay, no question. so I just paid my pick. I picked Cavaliers in seven, um, and I, I don't do it with apprehension. I think they're ha- they have right now, because the coaching, at least I know who I get. I think their bench is equal at least. Um, I think they have rest, but not too much rest. I think Golden State does. I think right now Kyrie, Love, and LeBron are playing the best they've ever played. Their chemistry is fantastic. I think they have a more physical roster, and the finals, historically, they allow for more physical play. I think it's a great series. Have you laid out your prediction yeah, yet? Yeah, you, you've thought long and hard about this. So I, I respect your pick because I do think the Cavs have a great shot. I'm picking the Warriors in six. Is it a good series? Oh, yeah. I think it's going to be a very good series. I think the hopefully the games are close. I have this theory. I don't know. It's not fully unpacked, but I just wonder if we see more blowouts nowadays because of the three-point shot. Oh, I think we do. And I don't like that because I don't want to see five or six blowouts. In last year was six blowouts and then a great game seven. A close game seven. You know, you know I what, want to see close games. You know what threes have done? If... Remember why they allow so many threes. The theory on threes initially was if you're down by 12 late, you're four shots out. But what they've actually done a little bit of that, but what they've done more of is if you get down, you get, get down early, big, it's discouraging. So we initially thought the three was great because a team could catch up. Yep. The problem is if a team gets hot from three and another team's cold and just shooting that low percentage shot – it's 24-6. Yeah. <laughs> and so what it does, it does close the gap more quickly, but it also creates more blowouts. Um, Adam Silver was on the show yesterday. And of his many topics, one, he talked about the super team, but he also talked about the one and done. You played college basketball. And I think it's very interesting where he, I believe this, I believe all players should have a choice. Carmelo Anthony could have gone to the pros. The no reason question. he went to college is Carmelo wanted to be a top 10 pick. I still think a majority of great high schoolers, great high schoolers, will go to college Mm. because they'll say, you know, I can go from 18th, unknown, see me play at Duke and Kentucky, known be good in the tournament. What is your takeaway? Adam Silver seems to be suggesting, now that they've gotten all the financial stuff done, the TV negotiation, yep. they're going after this. Where do you fall on it? Well, I think that I heard you say earlier, I believe, Nobody benefits from the one. The schools benefit. Kentucky's supposed to, but I don't know they do. I think the schools benefit. I think it's exploitation. I think the players don't benefit at all. The NBA doesn't benefit at all. But the college college basketball benefits because you get to see this these players these superstar players for one year and they advertise it promote yes. it the Shashevskis and I mean, imagine if the best players in the country were no longer playing in college even if it's only one year so i think but i think that's the height of exploitation cuz you can't even argue that they're getting any sort of education now so what are they there for for you to exploit them so my feeling is what's fair is that players could go straight out of high school if you're 18, you graduate from high school or don't graduate, you can go work at McDonald's or somebody. Nobody cares. Nobody says, oh, we got to get him an education. You just go get a job, auto body shop, whatever. But these ki- these basketball players, we want to put up the facade that we want them to get an education. And it's when a joke. It's not. Now, I think what would be best for basketball at both the collegiate and the professional level would be if they went 
like two years. But if not, you had to stay two years, but not everybody in every family is collegiate. No, I agree. I'm just saying for the, I'm saying for the game of basketball. I think now what's fair, like I said, you come straight out of high school if you're ready. But I think what would be better for the product, I think the quality of play in college would improve if these great players had to stay two years. Oh, I agree. I think the quality of the NBA would improve if they had to stay two years. They would come in. Michael Jordan stepped into the NBA averaging 20 po- 28 so, points so a did, game. So did Duncan. 28. Yeah. Duncan was Finished ready. Product. Now, LeBron was an aberration. He came right out of high school at 20, but nobody else did. Players now, if Lonzo Ball comes out next year and averages eight points, we're not going to be like, he's a bust. We're going to be like, well, give him time. Like Brandon Ingram, give him time. We have to wait and see. You wouldn't have to wait and see as long if they stayed two years in college. So I'm for either let them come straight out of high school or you stay two years. And I think that the Players Association, I believe, has some affinity to that. Like it's either – like baseball, you can either come straight out or you have to stay two years. Yeah. So there may be there's some thought I, about that. I am that. for choices for young people in America after 18, uh, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. One more chance to back out and take your calves. Nope, not going to do it. <laughs> Man, I, there's a, I'm telling you, there's a big part of me that would like to see them It's better win. for the NBA. It's, it's better for the NBA. Isn't it better for us? Oh, the God. goat the goat conversation continues for, and really gets heightened, right? You think it's over. But it, whatever the case, it no. continues. If he loses, if LeBron loses, it's over. Barring something Officially. unrealistic, right? Barring him like winning four straight after that, it's over. Sorry. Okay. But he's second best. Is there Colin might not show up for work. Being better than Magic day. and Kareem and Will. <laughs> yeah, like, like, we've like re- that's a we, problem. We've l- reduced LeBron's career to a stinker. Exactly. <laughs> History of basketball, <laughs> second best bum. Uh, Chris Broussard hits the hurt. With True Car, find out what other people in your area paid for the same car you're looking for. New or used. Visit True Car to enjoy a more confident, car buying experience. Richard Jefferson had an interesting quote, member of the Cavaliers. He said, you know, with Draymond, he was talking about trash talking and packing the finals. With Draymond, we understand your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Steph got kicked out of a game. Draymond got a suspension. I think we were the most poised team last year. Uh, I think this is actually uh, true. Uh, Never forget that poise under pressure just won the Super Bowl for the Patriots. It also won the national championship for Clemson over Alabama. Never forget that Atlanta had more pro bowlers than New England and the MVP at quarterback, and that Alabama had more first-round picks than Clemson. Poise won our national championship in college football and our Super Bowl. Poise just won the Masters. Poise in the last three minutes just won March Madness. Gonzaga had a one-and-done player. Carolina did not. Justin Rose had a major. Sergio won the Masters. Poise is a real thing. Villanova beat North Carolina. Villanova did not have a player drafted in the first round. North Carolina, Bryce Johnson did. Talent's not the only thing that wins these series. Poise, last year in the finals, won the series. Most of you felt Golden State had better players. Even in the recent championships in all these sports, Atlanta had more pro bowlers. Justin, the guy Sergio beat, he'd won the major. Justin Rose, he was the one favored in overtime, right? Extra holes, playoff, you you thought he'd win. Sergio would gag. He had the major. Alabama Clemson, Bama better players. Who was good, better late? Villanova, Carolina, Gonzaga, Carolina. So, like, talent's not the only thing that matters here. Uh, I also think Jim Jackson was on earlier. Um, I think coaching plays a part in this finals. We don't know exactly who is coaching tonight in Game 1 for the Warriors. We do know it's Tyron Lue, a very underrated coach for the Cavaliers, according to Jim Jackson. One time in particular... Um, LeBron didn't want to come out the game. And Ty said, no, you're going to sit down, and then I'll put you back in. 
that showed me right there who really had control of this team. And when LeBron is listening like that, the rest of the team follows. You know, I, th- there is also, there is something about when you have a player as good as LeBron, everybody knows late in a possession who's going to take over. More talent doesn't always equal great chemistry. Like when you have three guys who are three of the top five shooters in the league, KD, Steph, and Clay Thompson, who does take the last shot? I mean, that's why I've said I don't think the Warriors super team lasts forever. Shaq and Kobe didn't last forever. The Bulls could have because Pippen understood Jordan gets the ball late. The Celtics understood Bird gets the ball late. Lakers understood Magic had the ball late. The Cavs understand it's LeBron's team. When you have a problem, is more stars. This is what breaks up Guns N' Roses. Everybody knows it's Bono's band. That's why U2 still works. Like, the band breaks up when two thinks he's one. That's what hurt the Eagles. Okay, when you start looking at bands, what breaks them up? When you have a dominant number one Mick Jagger, Bono, the band lasts. When you got a two and a three, a three thinks he's a two, a two thinks he's a one, that's when you struggle. And so I, I don't think Golden State super team lasts that long. Uh, even if they win this series, you know, you're ultimately going to have to make some choices. Do you want to have four guys max salary? It's very hard. You're going to have very little bench. You're going to be very susceptible to one injury decimates your team. That's that's why it's so valuable to have a bench. I mean, obviously, if Steph gets hurt or LeBron gets hurt, no team's going to survive that. They're not going to be the same team. But when you have no bench and you're paying like four guys max, one key injury to a starter, and you're not the same team. So I'll take Cleveland to win this thing in seven. I think it's a really good series. Uh, I, I've said this to Christine before, and I, and I absolutely believe it. I think it's better for us if Cleveland wins. I think there are so many more interesting Conver- That's because you love LeBron. What do I say if Golden State trounces Cleveland in five? What do I say the next day? We can talk about Kevin Durant and what he's going to do moving forward. Sign if they're going the to be Warriors. Able- right, but he'll have to take a pay cut. And so. are they going to get rid of anyone on their bench? There's plenty well, of yeah, stories. Yeah, bench players are fascinating. How amazing it is that these guys could put their egos aside and play together. That's one segment. I've just given you three. I'm going to if if Golden State wins, I'm going to tell you right now, taking the What's day the off. What's the segment if if the Cavs? <laughs> I'm taking the day off. Dog. I know. What are you going <laughs> to talk about if if the Cavs win? Oh, is LeBron the new MJ? Like, yeah. Okay, we've for, talked about that for the last year. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about will Durant leave? Clay's unhappy. Does Kerr come back? What to do now that nobody can beat LeBron? Oh my God! If Golden State wins in a sweep, I'll just tell you right now, I'm going to be in Hawaii. I'll let you guys talk about for one segment how, what are they going to do with their bench players? I'm rooting for me. Selfishly, I'm rooting for easier shows. It's not going to be a sweep. (laughs) God, I hope not. Either way, actually. Hour three, Cedric Sabalas around the corner. Ah, this is The Herd. Wherever you may be and however you may be listening. Live in Los Angeles, iHeartRadio, Fox Sports Radio, and FS1. Christine Leahy is joining me. The guys at uh, Undisputed, the guys and gals on that show, were up at uh, the Bay Area for Game 1 of the Finals tonight. I think they're going to be at a few games over the weekend. Uh, We are anchoring here. We are anchoring here in Los Angeles. I was given Gottlieb last night. It was like, hey, I got a flight to the game. You want to go? I got tickets. I'm like, Gottlieb. I want to sit home and watch this game. I, I know, but your choice, to, like, now I can't go either because we're staying here. Listen, this going to games thing, you know, I, I, I like sitting home and having a big plate of nachos and a sandwich. Can you just, like, take one for the team? I don't like people in my ears talking about weird stuff. I like to zone in on games. I don't like watching games with other fans. Or I, people. You just like your cat. Yeah. Can the dog be invited or no? He makes too much noise. I need to zone in and get my methodologies and theories, and I take a pen and a paper and I write them down. I don't want disturbances. Everybody's like, hey, let's meet at Collins for the big game. And I'm like, I always give people the wrong address. I have no interest having people over. That's just just rude. One TV me, 
Even my wife, my my wife will come in during the football season. What's a nickel defense? I'm like, out, not interested. That's an advanced question, though. I give her some credit. No. That's no. That means she has a basic understanding. If she's asking about a nickel defense, guys, gals, you know what I'm talking about. Zone in for the big game. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go Google it in the other room? What a nickel back is. I'll tell you what it is. It's a bad Canadian band. Get out of my rope. At least she's trying to show interest in your job. You should appreciate that. I don't walk into an accounting firm. Hey, what do all these numbers mean? But you're not married to an accountant. She's she's your love. She's trying to be part of your world. If, if my wife was an attorney, hey, I'm taking that guy's side. Whose side are you taking? Hey, concentrate in the big game. No noise tonight. Dog, cat, dog makes one bark. Out. Uh, yeah, we know. Let's bring on Cedric Sabalos. All right, here we go. Cedric Sabal, 11 year vet, former All Star, slam dunk champ. You can still dunk, can't you? Oh, yeah. You can bring it down. Easy. Yeah, you Easy. Sat, listen to that. Can I just try something once? I want everybody to close their eyes. <laughs> you, have, you, have, you and Luke Walton have the greatest voices in the history of the National Basketball Association. Sweet. Have you ever been a DJ? I, I am a DJ now, yes. I, I did. I did um, you know, actually, when I, when, I, when I finished playing basketball, I, I did the morning show and I did the quiet storm. So I was doubling back. Like, I never got any sleep. My first seven years out of the league, I never got any sleep because I was coming up early, 4.30 in the morning, and then getting out of the studio about 12 midnight. And I lived about an hour away from the studio. So, I, you know. Who's your favorite artist old school all time? Oh, man, that's a hard question. I, I have to go with Nita Baker. Okay. I want everybody here to close your eyes. <laughs> I just want to pretend everybody that's watching our show in America, <laughs> unless you're driving, close your eyes. Give me a little setup like you're going to commercial. We'll be right back after these messages. But right now, a little Anita Baker right here on The Herd. Oh, God. That is really something. You're scaring me right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, my first takeaway is Scotty Pippen came out. Let's play the tape. Scotty Pippen. I- I'm telling you, you know. The thing about pro athletes, you guys live in weight rooms, and it's, you're all alpha males, mm-hmm. and you were the dominant guy in high school. The girls like you. The well, coaches me, like you. Yeah. Yep. So it's little Steph Curry comes in. A yeah, little Steph Curry guy. Looks like everybody's little brother. Yeah. And Scottie Pippen's talking about Steph Curry, and here's what he said about him. He's not the best player on either team. Is Even it? though he's a two-time MVP, a unanimous MVP, right now he's not the best player on his team. Right. And he's not a dominant player. But in terms of what LeBron and KD can do, those guys can dominate you in all areas of the game, Mm -hmm. from rebounding to blocking shots to defending to scoring. They beat you all across the board. Some of that's just because Steph Curry is small, right? Is is not a dominating physical presence. It's a lot to do with that. Uh, The first part of it, true, I think is true. No, he's not the best player in, in the finals. And he's not the second best player in the finals. I think KD and LeBron have that. He is definitely the third, and that third is really, really close to the second and first. Don't think it's not a far fetch. But I think if you, you put cornrows, tattoos, a couple of gold chains on him, you know he's Allen Iverson, and, and and everybody respected Allen being tough and this, that, and the other. Steph, uh, he, he, he plays hurt. He's finals. bred it's exactly. He's 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 been bred. To be what he is right now, he's he's, he's Leonard is is lives that the word uh, is great. His dad, unbelievable shooter. Why wouldn't his son be a, a tremendous shooter? You know, one of them was going to be unbelievable shooter. His his mom played ball too. Uh, he, they society doesn't want. You know, I, I got the same thing. And I said this yesterday with David Robertson. Everybody thought David Robertson was weak and a punk, and and he just wasn't soft it. because his son, his religion really. You, you you smelled his religion on him. In the same way with Steph, he conducts himself in a great way and it's, you, you, that we don't like in sports as fans. We want the guy, we want Babe Ruth's. We want the guy to be with 15 women and drinking and drinking and smoking and then knock a home run out of it. And Steph is not that. He he, he opens up his family to, uh, to the public. Uh, he's you know a great husband. He's a great father. He he puts himself in a position to try to help those. His religion is obviously steps first. He he turned down a huge endorsement because of that uh, with Nike. Nike said no, we won't put Bible scriptures on your sneaker. And um, you know Under Armour stepped up and said they would do that. 
Um, he's an everyday guy, and I think that's what makes Scotty and everybody else think that ah, he's not that good. Like, yo, he's an everyday, and he makes it look so oh, easy. God, yes, like man, he's like, the fastest scorer in basketball history. Sl- release has got to be the fastest to release. I mean, he's he just a pure shooter, and and that's why kids are go want to be Steph because it's a possibility to be a Steph. You know, it's funny because me and Shaquille had this conversation when when we were playing together. And he was like, you know, Shaquille has an ego. If you guys didn't know, I mean, he has yeah. a little bit of ego. And he couldn't figure out why his shoes weren't selling more than Allen Iverson. I said, Allen looks like everybody in America. You don't, Shaquille. You're seven foot three, whatever. Nobody looks like you. It's about three people in this universe that look like you. So if somebody is looking at somebody, hey, I can be Tom Cruise. I can be, you know, Allen Iverson. I could be Steph Curry. I'm the same height. My hair grows like his hair grows, same scenario. Then they want to adapt themselves or grow on to that. So there's, you know, Allen Iverson sneakers was definitely sell better than Shaquille's. You know, um, when you look at a final like this, I, I'm, I'm taking Cleveland in seven. I, and and I, listen, I know Cleveland shouldn't be favored. I totally get that. I do think there are a couple ramifications here. One, I think they're healthier. Kevin Durant got hurt in the second half of the season. Andre Guadala and Jaza in the playoffs got hurt. Steve Kerr's not medically clear to play yet. It's something. There is something. I also feel like the first year of the super teams, yes. it's never quite right. Like, yeah. now don't get me wrong, the first year of Wade, LeBron, Bosch, it looked all good. I mean, it looked good up until game three or four of the finals. Yes. I think we're forgetting. Like when I watch Golden State, I'm not. I'm not denying their talent. You tell me as a player, it kind of seems like Clay's lost at times, right? The chemistry's not. It took LeBron, Bo- and these are smart guys. LeBron, Wade, Bosh. These are high end, high caliber guys. Neck up. They get the game. Yeah. They were clunky in the first finals. Like when I watch Golden State, I don't think their spacing's always great. Right. What, what do you make of their chemistry? Well, I, I'm with you. I want. Cavs to win this in seven. Uh, for one, entertainment. I want whoever wins. I want it to go seven games, so so I don't have to start rooting for my Yankees, even though my Yankees are doing good right they now. They are. Um, I, I I think Clay' role has changed from your sharpshooter to your best defender. Exactly. And 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 I don't know if he's happy with that. And I always said, not this year. Whether they win or lose, next year, whether they win or lose, Clay's out of there. I think he will be the one to break up this super team, meaning that he has an ability. He's, he's won a championship, whether he wins one this year or next year. He'll have one or two or three maybe. And he's like, okay, it's time for me to go he be a star. He's not going to go to a bad team. He'd go to like a San Antonio. Yeah, yeah. he's not going to go to a situation where he has to rebuild them. And he's not that type of player. And and um, But I think he's going to be the one. Uh, when it comes to this team here, a lot of people are always talking about the poise of the team. Man, that's just the way they play. You know, last year, Steph made a bad pass. One. Crucial bad pass. Yeah. But look at the 15 million other passes that he made like that that were, that connected and, and, and went down. You know, it's interesting. Chris Bosh, who I really like as a guy, don't know him as a guy as well, but I know about some of his off-court stuff. Good mm-hmm. quality guy. He got worn out at the end. He kind of felt like he had become yeah. like like hey man you 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 stand over there we'll call you when we need you yes. and he was a star at Georgia Tech he could have gone high school to the pros he was twenty five a game in Toronto yeah. is there such a thing as an egoless star in the league who is the best player in the league that you've ever met that was egoless because I don't think you can be great at anything without it well he left last year and that was Tim Duncan Tim Duncan could care less he you know he. he not flashy. He didn't want to do it. Not he knew the necessity of interviews. He didn't want to do it. He didn't dance. He didn't show off. Uh, you know, maybe a fist pump or so, making a shot, didn't get in your face. Uh, he would lull you to sleep playing against him by talking to you about something that had nothing to do with basketball. You know, even even the the, the, the famous tape that they play over and over when Tim is talking to. Vince Carter and go, man, it's so unfair. You just got so much hops and I have so little. And and it's just, that's just the way Tim is. And and I think uh, it, even I, I, I'm going to switch it over to the Canadian and say Nash. Steve Nash was the same way. He didn't really he didn't really have an ego. Even coming into 
a scenario his rookie year with Jason Kidd, Hall of Famer, Kevin Johnson may or may not be a Hall of Famer. These great point guards, he didn't sit back and go, man, what am I doing here? He just, uh, this is my time to learn. Plug moved, away. Uh, moved on to Dallas, got booed at home every time he touched the ball, didn't let that discourage him, teamed up with Dirk and said, let's, let's transform ourselves, get our bodies right, put our mentality right. And, and once he figured out, let me start playing the way I've been playing as a little kid in Santa Clara. Then you couldn't stop that. But he, but as far as ego, nah. I mean, he just, you know, he he never really jumped on his teammates. And that may have been his downfall. He should have sometimes. He should have got on Amari. He should have got on Boris Diaw. He should have got on Joe Johnson sometimes because he was a two-time MVP. But he didn't. Um, and Tim has his same ways of getting on his players and, and talking to them. And, and, and but it's not ego-driven. It's not ego-driven, neither one of those players. Finally, Cedric Sabalos, NBA All-Star, slam dunk champ, 11-year uh, veteran. One and done, Adam Silver said yesterday, he suggested that now that they've gotten the financials and the TV deals out right. of the way, they're going to attack this. And it sounds like he wouldn't have a problem abolishing the one and done. Where do you fall on it? I'm, I'm the same way. I feel that... Uh, after high school, you can go to war. After high school, you can vote. You know, uh, why not go work for a f- for Fortune 500 company? I, I don't that's see what why the NBA you, is. I, that's what it is. It's just another company. It's a business. So you you know, I, after high school, you go apply. You know, and, and and see can you? I think the pressure should be put on the NCAA on saying. Hey, I went to I went to on job training. I tried to make the Lakers. I didn't make the Lakers. I got cut. Give me my scholarship back to Duke. I I sit this year that I got cut from the Lakers. I go to school, make my grades. The next year, just like a red shirt, I I get to be able to play for Duke and try it again and see if I can do it again. Now you only get one time to do that. Now you can't go and, and play a, a year with Duke and then go back to the league, get kicked out get cut and come back to Duke. You can't do that twice. But one time, just like that redshirt year, uh, and they do it for education when they did the four, Prop 48. They do it for injuries. They do it for military. They do it. They even do it for um, religions. Uh, when you go on your, when you're a Mormon and you go on your mission. Yes, you're It allowed right. you to go, to, you know, go yep. somewhere for two years. That's right. And come back and play. Same, same scenario. They, the NCAA should do that. They should allow them to go on the job training if they get cut. And, and most of the players, ladies and gentlemen, most of the players do not make it. It's a ton of them. I, I played with three that out of high school just could not get it together, was not mentally ready. One was not physically ready. Um, you know, eventually became a star, Steven Jackson. I got him his rookie year straight out of high school. He eventually became a star, won a championship. Uh, but Leon Smith uh, yep. at, at – at, uh, Remember it well. Yeah, for the Mavericks. Yep. Had psychological problems and just could I remember him calling me in the middle of the night. He said, Vet, uh, I got a flat. Change your tire. Oh, well, uh, how do I change my tire? I mean, he just was not ready sure. for the world to be grown. And some, some of these kids are not. So NCAA needs to look at it. Uh, I, I, as much as we're going to let them, let them in and as uh, us as NBA players or, or I'm in the league now, no. But as much as they're going to let them in, they have to be able to – something to fall back on if, if things don't go right. And, and, and they allow religion to be that reason. They allow injury. They allow academics to be that reason. Why not let, let on-job training be the reason? Good seeing you, man. Good stuff. Thank you, sir. Cedric Sabalos, smooth Anita Baker <laughs> on 94.7. Very excited. Uh, Jason Whitlock on earlier today. Uh, Jim Jackson, uh, Cedric Sabalo stopped by. I thought he had a really good idea on that. And the NBA Finals uh, start tonight. I'll, I'll say this. The Finals, uh, they start on June 1st tonight, and they go for 18 days. And this is exactly what they should do. The NBA of all the leagues has got this figured out. The baseball season is so long that the baseball playoffs are only 16% of the length of the regular season. In a more fragmented world today, where we're all going in different directions and we are all clearly distracted, I am, you am, we all are, we know people watch sports when they feel there's urgency. Urgency, Urgency equals playoffs. So the smartest leagues have figured this out. I'm not a big hockey fan. But the NBA and the NHL have figured it out. You want the longest playoffs possible. The NBA playoffs 
are almost 40% of the length of the regular season. They get it. Hockey's at 35. Baseball's at 16. So the baseball season has 84% of games with no urgency and then 16% of games of urgency. In the NBA, 40% of games, there's urgency. There's elimination at stake. So when people complain, I can't, I used to work at my former employer. There were a lot of seam heads, baseball guys in the building. I can't believe how long the NBA playoffs last. And I'm like, go take an economy class. What you're trying to do is create urgency. What you're trying to do is keep people in the building. This is why casinos don't have windows or clocks. They don't want you to think about time. That's why casinos pump oxygen into the casinos. Keep you alert. Keep you in the building. Time becomes irrelevant. You're all in emotionally. This is why malls have an escalator far left, an escalator far right. Exits are hard to find. You have to walk past all those stores and kiosks. They're trying to create an element of confusion. Long walks through the mall, seeing all the people leasing space and selling products. The NBA hooks you in, you know, May, mid, late May, early April, and they hook you. And right after the playoffs comes the draft, comes trading. It's the genius of the NBA. It's not a weakness. It is not a liability. That's how you do it if you run a business. Christine with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. By the way, I thought of uh, the biggest storyline if the Cavs lose and the Warriors win because you said it was going to be really boring if that was the case. If the Cavs lose, what do I say? Is LeBron going to leave the Cavs? <laughs> He's not going to leave the Cavs. Why not? He's going to demand a lot of changes, might threaten to leave to get those changes. It'll be a storyline. Absolutely. On whose show? Everybody's show. Not this show. Maybe on Crazy Guy. Can I have that in writing right now? That if the Warriors win, you will not discuss the topic of whether or not LeBron will leave the Cavs? He's got a year left on his deal. We're recording, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know the shows that do that? The huh. ones that listen to us every day and go, we, I wish I had a show like I'm gonna, that guy. I'm going to remember this. It's not a topic. Let's go back to the let's discuss bench players topic. <laughs> <laughs> that was fascinating. Okay, so this entire herd line is dedicated to fights because you've been all about the Incre- the fights all day. Incredible. So let's start with this one. Um, the Cowboys have been predicted to win only nine and a half games kind of by Vegas this yeah. year. Last year they won 12. Yeah. Des Bryant was asked his feelings about this year's team, and here's what he said on camera. No, that's my goal, and I feel like that's everybody else's goal is to, is to be better than last year. You know, um, Got a lot of great building blocks from last year. You know, it's nothing to sit on. It's how can we move forward and get better? How can we get, you know, take that next step? And I feel like we did that in the off season. We we are doing that in the off season by doing things that we don't have to do. They know just as well as I know we have something special. You know, uh, we we just got to keep it here and just take advantage of each and every day. Okay, but then off camera he said this Cowboys team is the best. I've been a part of, which to me sounds like shots at Tony Romo. Well, I think the team is going to be better than last year. I just don't think their record is going to be because their schedule, in my opinion, is the toughest in the league. Like, like, and it's, I don't even know who, if there's a second toughest schedule. I think they're going to win 10 games and be really good and better than last year, but they're not going to catch anybody by surprise. And, and they, you know, they kind of got a little break last year with injuries. They were mostly healthy. Sean Lee didn't even get hurt, did he, John? Sean Lee always gets hurt. He's due for an injury. I gave you a layup here on a fight, and you just dodged it. No, I dodged it. I don't want to. Listen, I I am hoping. I want harmony with the Cowboys. I don't want to be one of these media people hoping hoping for. So for them, you want harmony, but for everyone else, you want them to fight? Because Fox Sports needs the Cowboys to be good. I'm a company man. (laughs) Well, Tony Romo doesn't play for the Cowboys anymore, so that shouldn't matter. they're They're on our schedule like 12 times. I want them to be viable and great harmony. Well, they will be right. Go Good Dallas. harmony. <sighs> okay, well, here's another one of the fights that we talked about yeah. today. So Oscar De La Hoya and Dana White 
They were friends because Dana White was a special guest at the Chavez Jr. Canelo fight a little while ago of Oscar De La Hoya. He was his guest. Right. Um, now De La Hoya was criticizing Dana White for this Floyd Mayweather Conor McGregor fight, saying that it is bad for boxing, bad for UFC. Is sick of talking about it. And now Dana White to TMZ Sports is responding, and he's angry. But Oscar and I have always had a good relationship. I was just at the fight. He's talking about money grabs. Canelo Chavez. You know what I mean? You're going to put on a fight like that and then call McGregor, McGregor Mayweather a money grab when, when you were trying to make that fight four months ago. Why would you say something like that? Um, you know, instead, it, it makes it sound like he has no confidence whatsoever in Triple G versus Canelo. If he's watching this right now, what do you say to him? Oscar, what the <laughs> what, what? Seriously, <laughs> what the f- is going on with you? Are you nuts? Are you out of your mind? Have you lost your f- mind? Gosh. Canelo Chavez was really, really boring, mm-hmm. but they brought Triple G out at the end and announced that fight, so they saved it. Um, but I think that Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather, if it ever happens, which I don't think it's ever going to happen, could be really boring, too, because it's going to last like two seconds. Yeah. And even if it doesn't, it's a weird, odd mismatch of talents and skills. It's, it's a bad-looking fight, yeah. And finally... Austin Rivers was here yesterday. He was on our show and on Undisputed. And I thought what he said on our show was pretty tame. Um, And then Big Baby, I heard, had this video on Instagram that he put out coming back at him. And I was confused. But then I heard what Austin said on Undisputed. And it kind of makes sense. If someone is constantly out of shape, late, don't remember plays, how the hell are you supposed to play? So so I, I don't know where... That that even goes with the team. And that had nothing to do with him coming at my father. I, I really don't care. That's between him and my pops. So that's where it's tough because yeah. if it was just, they were just teammates, I don't think Austin maybe would have went there. But because his coach is his father and Big Baby was talking about his father, that's why he's coming back at him. But that's where that's tricky to have your son and your family as part of the team. Well, and I think you kind of have to prepare yourself for that. Although I know it hurts to hear someone say something about your dad, everybody has a right to say what they feel. Yeah, and I also think there's certain companies that won't let you hire a, like a family right. member. And right. That, that's kind of why. Well, and it's one thing if, if it, he's just the coach, but he's the coach and the GM. So I know, I, I do know that that raised some issues too in the locker room. Oh, of course other guys did. on the team like, what? Now we have the coach's kid with us and of course Austin's great I mean we, we enjoyed having him well, here but no matter what that situation is going to raise some there's always been a sense in the league that Doc kind of saved his career like not saying he wouldn't have played in the league but he Doc took him to a place that he wouldn't have had otherwise I mean I've heard that from players before fair or not there's maybe there's some animosity and jealousy we we saw are you gonna play the or big- it's just I mean imagine if you we're on a road trip and you're doing certain things, but you have to be careful now because the coach's son is there. Well, like, you don't know what's getting back to the coach. But do you want to hear what Big Baby's reaction was again? Yes, please. Play that again? I love this. All right, here we go. I'm in Hawaii minding my own business. And I look on Undisputed and I see old punk Austin River talking. Come on, man. Yeah, I might have been overweight a little bit. Probably late for one or two practices. Come on, man. Don't know the plays? Come on, bro. You're lying now, bro. Your father gave you your money. How can you, like, don't say to me. Your father gave you your money. You ain't work for it. Keep your mouth closed, man. Shut up, man. You're a bum who's been given the world. Shut up. Man. <laughs> I just realized, too, how close he had the camera to his face. But, uh... He's probably the gentlest trash talker. I wish he would say that stuff on our show and we could just beep it out. Why? Because I like combustible. He does say that, though. He would say that on the show. I have no he's problem. in Hawaii enjoying vacation. I have no problem admitting when I bring people on the show, I want you to have strong opinions. Mm-hmm. That's what I want people to have on the show. Create a show within my show. That's why Nick Wright's so great. He comes on the show and he's got a show inside the show. I think we need Doc now, though. Doc yeah. has to come in and... I would and- like... Give his two cents on everything. It was very. That was a, that was one of your best herd lines. I thought it was you were all you, about fights. It was for some reason you're feeling the fights. Today. No, I just I like this. As people are, this is raw. This is authentic. Like what Big Baby was doing, he was pissed and he let you know. Yes. And Dana White was pissed and he let you know. Yes. And everything's polished in the world now. I want to hear opinions I don't agree with. Why is everybody afraid of opinions they don't agree with? I like that. That that is a big A for me. A plus today.
Good job, big baby. <laughs> Christine with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Lie News. Takes more than a roof to make sure your home is covered. Farmers Insurance, 89 years of experience. Learn more at Farmers.com. We, we have, first of all, we have a lot of show left. Uh, Chris Broussard, uh, we got into this discussion. Christine and I have been talking about this. If you're the Boston Celtics, remember, the finals start tonight. They're done in two and a half, three weeks. The draft's after that. I'm telling you, if I am in the Celtics, I draft Lonzo Ball. Because I think the Celtics have a roster full of B minus guys, and he'll make them B plus guys. I don't think they'll jump a full grade. I don't think Isaiah Thomas makes guys better, and I think he's a defensive liability. Chris Broussard has some strong thoughts on that, taking you inside his sources, what they'll do. That's around the corner, plus our own spelling bee. An NBA Finals We're spelling bee. We're having a bee. spelling bee? Yeah. Can, am I playing? Well, we'll see. Heard spelling bee. In about six or seven minutes, I have the herd spelling bee, NBA final spelling bee. Very excited for this. Are you a good speller? Not really. My other former employer does this every year at this time, so I saw it this morning and thought, I'm going to do a herd spelling bee. Okay. But for Christine and I were arguing earlier today if it was smarter for Boston to take Lonzo Ball instead of Markel Fultz with the top pick. So when I brought Chris Broussard on, I asked him his sources. Who does he think Boston will take at number one? I think they take faults if they keep the pick, but I agree with you. If I'm Boston, I'm I'm messing with the Lakers because I do feel like the Lakers definitely want lines of ball, no matter what they're saying. Of course, they're smart to say other things. And if they get any of these other guys, as, as greatly talented as they are, Josh Jackson, Jason Tatum, Markel Fultz, to me, it's just another young hot shot that needs to get his. Right, Just like D'Angelo and Brandon Ingram and Jordan Clarkson and the rest of the guys they have, Julius, thing together. That's what he does. Lonzo Ball, he's bringing everything together. That's what he does is make other people better and create unity on the team, on the court. And that's what the Lakers need. They have a lot of young talent. They don't really need another young, talented guy that wants to shoot the ball all the time. So I would go with Lonzo Ball. And if I'm Boston... I'm putting it out there that I want ball, and if you want him, Lakers, you're going to have to give something up. Yep, that's right? it. Exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of games. You know, Mel Kuyper used to always say this. He's like, listen, I know I get manipulated around the draft. And so there's a lot of stuff said before, NFL draft, NBA draft, and let me tell you, this Lakers now, you know, <laughs> we're not really that interested. <laughs> you and I know it. We live in this city. Alonzo Ball is who the Lakers want. No question. And I don't think I think they're right on that. Now, Scottie Pippen, do we have the Scottie Pippen bite? Scottie Pippen is saying yesterday, it's kind of interesting that Steph Curry, well, here's Scottie Pippen from yesterday. He's not the best player on either team. Is Even that- though he's a two time MVP, a unanimous MVP, right now, he's not the best player on his team. Right. And he's not a dominant player. But in terms of what LeBron and KD can do, those guys can dominate you in all areas of the game, mm-hmm. from rebounding to blocking shots to defending to scoring. They beat you all across the board. Why, why can't any of these stars embrace Steph? <laughs> what is it, man? <laughs> Fastest score in league history. Nobody <laughs> likes him. Well, let me – first of all, Scotty was admitting on national TV that he wasn't a dominant player because he was never the best player on his team when he was winning championships with Michael Jordan. Okay, was Shaq or Kobe not dominant? With I guess Kobe, because Shaq was the best player on the team. Kobe was still dominant. So who wasn't dominant, Magic or Kareem? <laughs> you know, like you have to be the best player on your team to be dominant. That's ridiculous. Go look at the Celtics with Russell and Havlicek and Casey Jones. And exactly. Were- I mean, come on, man. It's like, I, I look, with current players, I think the reason some of them have issues with Steph, and I've talked to some about this, is because Steph, you have to guard him, and he'll light you up. But then he doesn't guard you, opposing point guards. So it's kind of like a sucker punch. Like, I got you, and then you run away, and you don't give me a chance to, to get back at you. Because Clay Thompson generally picks up. And their- it's smart by the Warriors. Because you know, Clay's Steph's a great a defender. Yeah, it's smart strategy. It's not Steph's fault. But that is why some guys do kind of look at him differently and say, well, you know, it's basketball. It's not just shooting. It's both ends of the court. The thing is, very few of the point guards are great defenders. You know, but at least they they feel like at least they try. Who here? Here are the two players you. in American sports that are great, but get 
a lot of pushback. Russell Wilson, Seahawk quarterback and Steph, both are mature. Yeah. Both are um, um, good emotional, even temperament. Good uh, families, strong families. Like it's interesting, right? Yeah. Like people love Cam, but they don't like Russell. <laughs> Russell's a better player. People are all over Steph Curry. He comes out with a shoe. Let's be honest. Is it Russell Wilson and Steph to some degree kind of burb kids? And it, does it create some resentment in the league? I, I hope not, but it seems like that. Like you, you just hit it on the head. It seems like that is an issue. How can Russell be 50-50 love in his locker room? They were a losing franchise before him. Unbelievable. You know, they're clean cut. Uh, as you said, they, they're sub- from the suburbs. They came from, you know, money. Um, they're, you know, family guys. Yeah, kind of religious. Both of, them, both of them are actually religious. Um, and I hope that's not the case because they that, – and, and let's face it. We're talking about the African-American community because it's, it's a lot of African-American players that have trouble with, with Russell. And obviously in the African-American – you know, African-Americans dominate basketball. So uh, a lot of the players you talk to are having issues with Steph. But I would say – that when we all talk about uplifting the black community, that's what we want. We want more Steph Curry's and Russell Wilson. Well, I used to we s- want guys coming from great families and getting educations and having legitimate marriages and raising their children up. You know, that's what we want. Well, so I used to people def- got to start thinking about that when they criticize. I used guys. to always say that when people would say oh, Obama was detached, and I used to say. Why? Because he doesn't run to his Twitter account? Like, is that, Thank you. That's a weakness? I, I like my president to have some ability to go, all right, that hurt. I'm going to take a deep breath. Not sprint to his Facebook account. Yeah, no, nah, no question. Okay, no question. so I just paid my pick. I picked Cavaliers in seven, um, and I, I don't do it with apprehension. I think they're ha- they have right now, because the coaching, at least I know who I get. I think their bench is equal at least. Um, I think they have rest, but not too much rest. I think Golden State does. I think right now Kyrie, Love, and LeBron are playing the best they've ever played. Their chemistry is fantastic. I think they have a more physical roster, and the finals, historically, they allow for more physical play. I think it's a great series. Have you laid out your prediction yeah, yet? Yeah, you, you've thought long and hard about this. So I, I respect your pick because I do think the Cavs have a great shot. I'm picking the Warriors in six. Is it a good series? Oh, yeah. I think it's going to be a very good series. I think the – hopefully the games are close. I have this theory. I don't know. It's not fully unpacked, but I just wonder if we see more blowouts nowadays because of the three-point oh, shot. Oh, I think we do. And I don't like that because I don't want to see five or six blowouts. In last year was six blowouts and then a great game seven, a close game seven. I want to see close games. Adam Silver was on the show yesterday. And of his many topics, one, he talked about the super team, but he also talked about the one and done. You played college basketball. And I think it's very interesting where he, I believe this, I believe all players should have a choice. Carmelo Anthony could have gone to the pros. The reason he went to college is Carmelo wanted to be a top 10 pick. I still think a majority of great high schoolers, great high schoolers, will go to college Mm. because they'll say, you know, I can go from 18th, unknown, see me play at Duke and Kentucky, known be good in the tournament. What is your takeaway? Adam Silver seems to be suggesting, now that they've gotten all the financial stuff done, the TV negotiation, yep. they're going after this. Where do you fall on it? Well, I think that I heard you say earlier, I believe, nobody benefits from the one. The schools benefit. Kentucky's supposed yeah. to, but I don't know they do. I think the schools benefit. I think it's exploitation. I think the players don't benefit at all. The NBA doesn't benefit at no. all, but the college college basketball benefits because you get to see this these players, these superstar players for one year. And they advertise it, promote yes. it. The Krzyzewskis. And, and imagine if the best players in the country were no longer playing in college, even if it's only one year. So I think – but I think that's the height of exploitation because you can't even argue that they're getting any sort of education now. So what are they there for? For you to exploit them. So my feeling is what's fair is that players could go straight out of high school. If you're 18, you graduate from high school or don't graduate, you can go work at McDonald's or somebody. Nobody cares. Nobody says, oh, we got to get him an education. You just go get a job, auto body shop, whatever. But these ki- these basketball players, we want to put up the facade that we want them to get an education. And it's a when joke. It's not. 
Now, I think what would be best for basketball at both the collegiate and the professional level would be if they went like two years. But if not, you had to stay two years, but not everybody in every family is collegiate. No, I agree. I'm just saying for the, I'm saying for the game of basketball. I think now what's fair, like I said, you come straight out of high school if you're ready. But I think what would be better for the product, I think the quality of play in college would improve if these great players had to stay two years. Oh, I agree. I think the quality of the NBA would improve if they had to stay two years. And I think that the Players Association, I believe, has some affinity to that. Like it's either like baseball, you can either come straight out or you have to stay two years. So there may be there's some thought about that. Chris Broussard earlier today, I was watching the spelling bee on my former employer's network today, and I thought to myself, NBA Finals game one tonight, let's have our let's have our own spelling bee. John Goulet, if you could, this is the herd spelling bee. The moderator. Yeah, you're the moderator. Please go ahead. Age okay. fifty something. <laughs> uh spell the word LeBron. G O A T oh, Goat. Geez. That's correct. Thank Spell you. the this last name of the Cavs head coach. Last name of the Cavs head coach. J A M E S James. Also correct. <laughs> That's and true. Final one. Spell the word ball hog. Spell the word ball hog. Oh my goodness. W E S T B R O O K Westbrook. That is correct. Three for three. This was the dumbest spelling bee ever. This is Great a Catherine spelling bee. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Ball hog. I had to think about that one. Oh, really? Yeah, because you could also deep? spell it H A R D E N, but I. I... Come on. <laughs> that uh... was out of simply out of respect for my former employer. <laughs> Um, so game one tonight, Christine likes in seven. She likes the Warriors. I'm going to take the Cavs in seven. I think we're both rooting after what we just witnessed in the respective conferences, a really thoroughly entertaining long finals. 